Let's have a little bit of a discussion in practicality and expectations when it comes to luxury watches. I know I've been guilty of this and there's certainly nothing wrong with it. I don't want to imply anything wrong with this, but I'm always looking for the value for money, the bang for buck. I think most of us are that are watch enthusiasts in this hobby and it's really satisfying to buy a watch that hits all of the sweet spots in terms of tech and size and materials, fit, name cachet, name prestige. And I think one of the best watches out there that hits the criteria at the luxury price segment is the Omega Seamaster Professional 300. I could go on about this watch. It's lovely. It doesn't have very many flaws. And for the going rate, it is really difficult to beat. And a lot of times, if you're opting for a different watch, it comes down to personal preference in terms of stylistic, uh, you know, stylistic desires. So I think it's a fantastic watch, great value for money. And now I'd like to share with you a watch that is a little bit opposite on that spectrum, but still from the same brand. This is the Omega Seamaster 300 with the lapis lazuli dial that just looks absolutely phenomenal. It is a really interesting, vibrant blue metamorphic rock that is considered a semi-precious stone here. And it just looks so dang good, especially when you pair it with the 18 karat yellow gold. So I look at this and I don't think that this is a value proposition. And so the people that are shopping and consuming this type of a luxury good, they're not coming at this with the same mindset that I would. You know, when I'm looking at a Longines, when I'm looking at a Norris, when I'm looking at a Hamilton, and I'm looking for that bang for buck, that consumer of this fine luxury good, they're looking for that emotional connection. And the price, the perceived value for money that's entirely secondary. And so I have to remind myself as I spend time with some of these higher end watches that I'm not necessarily the target demographic, but I can absolutely appreciate what is being presented here from the Swatch Group brand. I think this is lovely. There is a warmth and a luster and an allure to full precious metal, to yellow gold. And there is a weight that never ceases to surprise me. Even when I'm expecting it, I know, okay, when I pick up this gold watch, I know it's going to be heavier, much heavier than stainless steel. But every time I go to pick one up, it is just so hefty. And I love that. I absolutely love that. So I look at this piece and I like the fact that Omega is bringing their A game in terms of, you know, lovely materials, precious metal, semi-precious stone and the lapis lazuli material. And then they are hearkening back to their original dive watch design from the late 1950s with this 300 design. I like that. I think this is a lovely blend, a uh, blend of material, blend of design, blend of execution and blend of movement technology. So within this watch is the 8912 caliber, which is a master coaxial caliber certified by the Swiss Federal Institute of Metrology in addition to the, the COSC. So it is very well dialed in. This will be anti-magnetic to 15,000 gauss, an absolutely absurd number that you will likely never even get close to meeting in everyday situations. It's just nice to know that your watch is so robust and dialed in and beautiful. Now, my only critique about this is the fact that the 8912 has a red gold bridge. It has a red gold rotor. And when you pair that with yellow gold, it just presents a little bit of a mismatch that is slightly off-putting to me personally. I almost think that it would have been a better move from Omega to put a classic 8900 in here that doesn't have the precious metal, but would not carry the mismatch and uh, just the visual aesthetics of the combination. Now let's, uh, let's continue with the tactile elements here in this review. We have a 120 click unidirectional bezel. We have a ceramic bezel insert with Sarah gold indexing, which you guys can see is brushed in a circular pattern. That's really nice attention to detail. The light play is great when it comes to the ceramic, the glossy alligator, vibrant blue strap, and of course the lapis lazuli dial. And I would say for those of you saying that this is just too loud, too bold, too proud, too out there. Well, when you're buying a full gold watch, you're not trying to fly under the radar. You want to celebrate the amazing piece of men's jewelry that tells you the time that you're wearing on your wrist. 
So I would not knock Omega for doing such a loud and almost almost obtuse looking strap combination with this watch. I think it's great. And I will say the lapis lazuli is very intriguing to me. Historically, this stone has been used by humans for millennia. You go back to ancient Egypt and King Tut's death mask was made out of yellow gold and lapis lazuli, which is really interesting. Queen Cleopatra would ground up lapis lazuli into a powder and use it for her blue eyeshadow, you know, for her makeup. It's it's makeup fit for a queen that ruled the world at the time. It's really an interesting stone historically, and I think it looks lovely. And you look at this in various light situations from afar, it almost just looks like a royal blue dial. And then you get up close or you see it in sunlight and it really sings. And I love seeing that slight reflectance to the surface, to the material, where you can see the underside of the second sand slowly sweeping across. And that is also done in precious metal. I like the low light luminescence of this watch. In classic Omega fashion, we have a bi-tone or a bi-color loom application of Superluminova. So most of the markers, the hour hand, the running seconds hand is done in that cyan or that aqua tone. And then your minute hand and your bezel pip is done in the green. Looks great. In natural light, you guys can see it is the old radium configuration of the formula, which honestly on most stainless steel watches can come across as a little bit overly done, overly baked in the sun, a little bit too creamy. I don't love it in every instance, but I've got to say in a yellow gold watch with gilt accenting and gold hands, it feels very appropriate. And I don't think this would look as attractive if it had stark white or desaturated uh, formula of Superluminova. Now, just going back to this watch and trying to sum up here, I like what I see. But again, I'm not the target audience or the target demographic with this piece. I'm not looking to spend $30,000 on a watch. And if I were, I don't know that I would spend it on one watch. I would certainly be tempted to, but I think like a lot of watch enthusiasts, I'd want to take that money and say, okay, there's my Rolex, there's my Omega, there's my Grand Seiko, there's my this and my that. And I would want to break it up into multiple. So again, I'm not necessarily the target demographic here. And I, again, I look for the value like many of you, and there's certainly nothing wrong in doing that. But you compare this Seamaster 300 to several other precious metal watches. I'm going to start with Rolex and I'm going to drop in a picture and some clips of a full gold Submariner that I had uh, just the opportunity to spend some time with last summer. And that watch had a full gold bracelet. It was lovely. It was hefty. It was very sharp, especially in natural light. And the retail price, I believe, is within a couple thousand dollar difference of the retail price of this Seamaster 300 Lapis Lazuli dial. And so that just goes to show that you're not getting a bracelet here with the Omega. You're not getting the addition of the value of some more yellow gold to the overall package. And so in that aspect, this is not a value pick. But again, when you're buying a gold watch, you're not shopping for value. If that was the case, I think everybody would be lining up to purchase a Carl Bucherer chronograph that's done in gold that does carry you know, a flyback chronograph and you're going to be spending under $20,000 in most instances. So really buying at this level, uh, this price segment, you're not buying for the value. You're not looking for the bang for buck. You're looking for those watches that you connect with that speak to you that are unique. In some cases are hard to come by because that is the definition of luxury. And I think this watch hits the sweet spots in that regard. It's, it's so beautiful. It's unique. And you're not going to see very many of these out there. I love the pairing of the lapis lazuli with the 18 karat gold with the retro design elements in this dive watch from Omega. I think this is a really lovely piece. Not to mention the fact that this carries my favorite practical complication, the jumping hour or the time zone feature. So in the end, I'm just <laughs> excited to have spent a little bit of time with this lovely watch. And I would love to see the green malachite dial variation. I think that one also looks exceedingly sharp. 
and I think will become a great collectible one day. So guys, let me know if you have any specific questions about the Omega Seamaster 300, about the Lapis Lazuli dial, maybe the Malachite, whatever it is you're thinking about, please put it in the comment section. Thank you very much for watching today. And for those of you shopping for an Omega, whether it's a high-end model like this or a traditional Seamaster or Planet Ocean or Speedmaster, I'm going to put my recommendation in the description, which is exquisite timepieces in Naples, Florida. They're the authorized dealer that I purchased my Omegas from, and uh, they've just been great in lending and watches over the past couple years. So uh, Nick's contact is in the description. He's a longtime viewer. He's a young watch enthusiast. And they can definitely take care of you if you're shopping for an Omega. So again, thank you for watching today, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you real soon. Uh -huh.